our friends watching us online. Sorry, we are so late. The Holy Spirit just did some wonderful things here, didn't he, guys? That sounds anemic. The Holy Spirit did some wonderful things today. And he's going to continue to do it. Jesus has questions. Do you have answers? Today, our fourth part of the series is one simple question. What would you have me do for you? If you have a grandchild that needs Jesus, raise your hand right now. What would you have Jesus do for you? If you have a child who needs Jesus right now, what would you have me do for you? I want you to think, if you are infirmed in your body and you desperately want a healing, what would you have me do for you? If you're tormented in your mind, if, there, if there's an area of your life that's not in kingdom order, Jesus says, what would you have me do for you? Four students skipped a math exam, and they decided they weren't ready for the test. And they told the teacher the reason they skipped the math exam, on the way to school, they got a flat tire, and that's why they were late. So the teacher said, no problem, I'm going to let you take the test now. And she put each of the kids in four corners of the room where they couldn't see each other or talk to each other. And she said to the kids, I'm not going to give you the same test the class had. I'm just going to give you a one-question test, and if you all get it right, you get an A for the class. And the kids are going, this is going to be a piece of cake, and here it was. Which tire was it that got flat? <laughs> Jesus has questions. Do you have answers? These past few weeks, we've already considered a number of questions that Jesus asked. The question we're going to ask today is going to solicit a response from us, but probably not today as a result of all the other things we did, but probably by next week. We often have a belief system about Jesus that is different than the actual Christianity we're living out. How many of you believe God loves black, white, red, yellow, brown, and olive skin people equally? As long as some of those other people don't marry your daughter. Sometimes a person might think. In my 40 years of pastoring, a lot of people believe something with conviction, they say, until it affects their life. I've watched many individuals have a theological paradigm shift because all of a sudden their daughter's pregnant. And now they believe something different on a key subject. Uh, we had a couple, when Marge and I first went into ministry, actually it's before you even got there. Marge and I got married on September 15th, 1979 at 2 p.m. in British Columbia. I went into the ministry before we got married on June 6, 1979. I think I got my dates right, in Ontario, Oregon. And there was a young man who was 17 years old who got a young girl who was 17 years old in the youth group, primarily pregnant. And the parents really are decent people. And they were pro-life people. They did not believe in abortion until their son got this girl pregnant. What's interesting is the parents said, no, I, you got to abort the baby. I mean, this is a different situation. And they completely lost their true north in this situation. Well, after talking to them and praying with them, they realized we've blown it. We screwed up here. I just got an email recently. The girl is 40 years old now, and she's a missionary, and God has used her supernaturally. And the family's not offended by the story. They realize the difference between their actual belief system and their aspirational belief system was completely different when all of a sudden they were confronted by reality. We often have a disconnect between what we believe and what we experience. How many of you believe healing is for today? How many of you have a hard time sometimes believing it when you're sick? When you're throwing up? When you're crippled in body? When you're diagnosed with cancer? There's a young lady that you'll be getting to know that'll become a part of our church. She is 26 years old. Our former children's pastor's back in Seattle, and she was just diagnosed with melanoma cancer right on the side of her head, right on her temple. And they just did the operation, I think it was last week or the week before, and the margins are clean. They got the entire melanoma, can, and no chemotherapy necessary. Can we say thank you, Jesus? I mean, it's an awesome thing. But 
she believes in healing. She believes it's for today. But how many of you know when you get that diagnosis, you have cancer, your loved one has Alzheimer's or whatever it is, there often is a disconnect between what we really believe and what we say we've believed. We believe in a Christ that forgives sin, yet we're often overwhelmed by guilt. Do you really believe Jesus forgives your sin? Do you really believe it? How many of you have ever been overwhelmed with guilt? I have. We, by the way, shame is not always a bad thing. If it's continual, we're so afraid of shaming people. Shame often leads to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, or comes as a result, rather, of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, we're repenting. Nobody wants to live in shame and guilt for their entire life. We believe in a God who gives us hope, yet at times we feel hopeless, that disconnect. Look at the questions of Jesus. A little boy is telling his grandma how everything's going wrong in his life. How many of you have a grand, anyone have a grandchild that's a little bit negative? You know what I'm talking about? He says, I, I, I was reading this, he says, my school's going wrong, friends that's going wrong, family's going wrong, money's going wrong, and on and on and on. And grandma's baking a cake while he's telling the story. She asks her grandson if he'd like a snack, which of course he does. So she hands him cooking oil and says, drink this. He says, yuck, that's gross. How about a couple of raw eggs? Grandma, that's sick. Would you like some flour then? Maybe some baking soda. You can eat it right now. And then it's kind of interesting. Then grandma replies, yes, all these things by themselves seem bad. But when they're put together in the right way, they make a wonderful, delicious chocolate cake. God knows when he puts these different experiences in our life, which can, it can be rejection. It, 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 it can be suffering. It can be a season of unanswered questions. When he puts them all together, they work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We just have to trust in him, and eventually, they all make something wonderful. Many of you know one of my favorite books is um, Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline. And here's where he has this classic quote. God will never waste a hurt. God will never waste a hurt. How many of you have a hurt in your life right now? How many of you are going through a difficult season right now? And you're saying, God, I have a question. Why? Now, the, the Christianity we possess is often very unlike the Christianity that we find in the New Testament. How many of you have ever thought, I'd like to go back 2,000 years and live with the disciples? Have you ever thought that just for a moment? What would it be like? They were martyred. They lined the road with crucifix as people were crucified. I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a brutal time. No flush toilets. How many of you grew up? How many of you grew up in a home with an outhouse? Wow. I just feel like Marty McFly in Back to the Future. You see, friends, but whenever I look at what is biblical Christianity, as Francis Schaeffer calls it, as C.S. Lewis called it, what is biblical Christianity? And why is it so different than the Christianity we see today? There's a question here that's going to help us today. I believe the question that Jesus asked today will help us to ratchet up our level of relationship with him. This may take us two, if not three weeks to complete, but it's one of my favorite questions. Jesus calls us to be very specific and targeted in our requests. Now, I've added something for you. That's really the big idea from last week. But if I was to add to it, it would be, it is paramount that we pray in a way that is congruent with his purpose and has maximum impact on others. But the real part of the question is this. Jesus calls us to be very specific and targeted in our requests. How often do we just pray because it's a 9-11 type thing? It's an emergency. Things aren't going my way. Or how specific and how targeted and how dialed in are you really when you pray? He says you have not because you ask not. And what's the other part? 
or you ask a mist to consume it upon your own lust. Our question from Jesus is found in the Gospel of Luke, and Steve, give me just a little bit more if you would, and it's the story of a blind beggar that's had an up-close and personal encounter with Jesus. You know what blows my mind? Why is it a guy like Bartimaeus is blind and he finally sees Jesus? And why is it some of us are so sighted and we never see Jesus? Why is it a guy like the Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul, uh, he never sees Jesus when he's sighted, but when he's blind, he recognizes. Is that you, Lord? Interesting situation. Let's read it. Luke 18, 35. As Jesus approached Jericho. Have you ever been to Jericho? I'm hoping to take a group by 2021. Have you ever been there? It's a low place. It's an interesting place. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside doing what he does. It's just what blind people do in this culture. There, there is no welfare. There is no social security. This is his way of surviving. He was begging. I've known many blind people through the years, and uh, they've been wonderful. They've been incredible. I grew up with a guy named Gene Asner. They, he was a preemie, and they left him in the incubator too long and literally fried his eyes. And Gene has gone on to become a wonder boy in the area of IT. I mean, he has done incredibly well. But you know something, somewhere along the line, it's amazing how this guy, in not being able to see, his other senses seem to be heightened and his level of awareness. You know how that works. But let me tell you a little bit about this, um, this, this blind man, if you will. This blind man, we are told, is a beggar. His family and friends either wouldn't or couldn't provide for him. Mark informs us the man's name was Bartimaeus, that means son of his father's name, Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus. Everyone say Bartimaeus. Now the tragedy of this man's life is he ends up alone. It almost sounds like Hemet in the streets. I want you to hear this. This is a street person. He ends up alone in the streets. A little different twist on the story. The man positioned himself at the entrance of Jericho and he's trying to get funds from the visitors who do not even know him. He's just hoping as it's alms for the poor, alms for the poor, that somebody will have compassion on him. Bartimaeus hears the commotion of Jesus entering the town, and like us, he asks a question. Let's look at his question before we look at Jesus's. Luke 18, verse 36 and 37. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked, what was happening? I wonder when people come by HCA, do they ask, what's happening? What's going on? What's really taking place in there? They told him, Jesus, you've got to get this, of Nazareth is passing by. You may think Nazareth is a geographical distinction. It's actually a slur. It's saying, Jesus, can anything good, what? Come out of Nazareth. Jesus is from Hemet. Jesus is really from a city that people go, I mean, come on, admit it. When you travel, people say, where are you from? Oh, I'm between Temecula and Palm Springs. <laughs> you know? Maddie, don't get excited. You don't say you're from Moreno Valley. Oh, I'm right by L.A. We have a tendency. No, you say it proud, right? Yeah, really. But you know the bottom line? I tell people I'm from Hemet. And they say, What's Hemet? What's Nazareth? That kind of vibe, if you will. Now hear this. Luke 18, verse 36 and 37. Oh, I already just read that. Bartimaeus is thinking he's hit the mother load. All of these visitors are what? Potential donors. They're going to invest in his blind ministry, if you will. These people are on their way to Jerusalem, which is 17 miles up the hill from the plain of Jericho. Isn't it interesting, guys? I know we're kind of higher than Palm Springs. You go down. But it's kind of interesting that when you look at Jericho, there you are on the 
desert floor, man. You're just on the bottom of the world. Let's go up to Zion. Let's go up to Zion. You're ascending to go to the holy hill of God. And the reality is, friends, a lot of us feel like we're on the desert floor here. A lot of us feel like, man, I'm in a financial situation. I'm in a physical situation. I'm in a life situation. I've talked to a lot of you. A lot of you really look at Hemet, like the song by the Eagles, as if it's the hotel California. You can check in you can check in any time you want, but you can never leave. I'm glad to be here. Now I want you to feel where Jesus is at in his life, the timeline of his life and his ministry. When he's going through Jericho, there's blind beggar Bartimaeus 17 miles away from the city of God. Jesus is literally, let's see, how far? Yeah a week away from crucifixion. And Jesus, like a flint, he literally fixed his eyes on his destiny on the cross. Jesus knew the exact time because he's a Jew that knew Passover, communion. He knew the Pesach. He knew the very moment that he would give up the ghost and die for your sins and mine. Luke 18, 38, he called out, Yeshua ben Davi, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. How many of you need some mercy today? Do you need? I, I need it every day. That's why the mercies of God are new every third month. Well, some of us live as if that's what we believe. His mercies are new every morning. Notice that he calls Jesus, and this is key. If we get nothing else today, this is key. He calls him Ben David. Everyone say Ben Ben. David, David. son of David, son of David. Now, this is very important, and you've got to get this today, because I'm wondering, do we in the church know who Jesus really is? Do we often, like a cult, use the name of Jesus, but it's another Jesus, another gospel, it's something completely different? Here's a guy, he's, wait a minute, wait, th- guys, this is a clue. This is something that, when you're a Jewish boy, brought up in the scriptures, when you see this, wait a minute, not very many people call him, they may call him an, a son of Abraham, just as a Jew, generic term. But son of David, this is huge. I can see I've got you excited, sort of. (laughs) Everyone knew that when the Mashiach, the Messiah came, he would be Ben David, the son of David. This is something, friends, that I never learned in seminary. I knew it going into seminary. I knew this at five or six years of age. But this is something we miss And the trajectory of the church can be off if we don't get this. It's that important. Everyone knew this. This is the fulfillment that the Lord had made to David Melech, King David, a millennium, a thousand years earlier. Let's read it. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 through 14. When your days are over, this is God talking to uh, David, and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come, David didn't understand this, from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build the house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom. King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of peace. Glory, hallelujah. I will establish his kingdom forever. I will be his father. I do nothing that I've not seen my father do. My meat is to do my father's will. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're my father. I will be his father. And he will be my son. There's no way David would have understood this passage. He's saying, boy, God is really different. I don't understand you. This is a great time for your thoughts are not my thoughts. He would have a son, and David's trying to figure this out. 
I'm going to have a son. Listen to what he just said to him. When you read the scripture, do you just have devotions or do we dig deep and see what's going on here? Okay, here's what he's saying to David. You're going to have a son, David, after you're dead, who, by the way, is going to be God's son. Wow. Really cool. That's different. I've never heard that before. How could any descendant of David, I mean, he did fornicate, he was an adulterer, he was a murderer. The guy did a few things that would have got him kicked out of any of our evangelical churches today. He had a heart after God, he knew how to repent. And he's being told, David, the Messiah, the Son of God, it's coming from your loins, dude, you'll be dead. You'll be long dead. But rest assured in this promise. How could David know that a thousand years after he was dead, watch this, that God would step into human history and place the Messiah in a teenage girl's womb who was the line of David. This is powerful. Oh, and she was from Nazareth. Guys, give me just a little bit more here. I want to keep my voice for all the services. God did this at a time in history when there was no king on the throne from the tribe of Judah for 600 years, and yet God wanted a king on the throne from the tribe of Judah because that's what he promises in the book of Genesis after the sin of Adam and Eve, after the fall, that the scepter will not depart out of Shiloh. It's going to be a part of Judah, 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 and 600 years, no king from the tribe of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C., but God made a promise. And here's a blind beggar. Ben David. Ben David. Dude, you've not been to the yeshiva, the Jewish seminary. You've not sat under the teachings of Gamaliel, a Jewish rabbi, or Hillel, or Shimei. It's like, you can't know these things. We've got to look at who else has ever used this term before. This was the end, 586 B.C., of the Davidic kings, or from the tribe of Judah, until Jesus. You've got to watch why this is so significant, why Jesus is so powerful, why it's not enough to just tell our kids, Jesus loves me, this I know, and it's a great thing to tell them, and it's a great thing to sing, and it's a classic, but they need to know, who is this Jesus? We have to understand in Catholicism and in Renaissance art, having an effeminate Jesus on a cross with a loincloth is completely unlike what this Jesus is really like. I'm just a little excited. Even when Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt Jerusalem, there was no king from the line of Judah. The Jews were going through the motions for 600 years. Could you imagine? Wouldn't it be terrible if in the church we went through the motions for 600 years now and just said, okay, just pray. I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Okay, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Should have bought a Honda. Kamasaki. Okay, good, you got the tongues. Wouldn't it be terrible if we just came and said, okay, let's sing our songs. I worship you. I love you. You're awesome. Oh, time for the offering. We forgot the offering. Everyone come back, please. Could we ever become like the Jews for 600 years and just go through the motions? Now watch, watch, watch this. When Jesus Christ was born, who was the king on the throne in Israel? Herod, you know the Christmas story. Even if it's not really the Jesus story, it's still a Christmas story, right? It was Herod. He was on the throne. Herod was a foreigner. Herod was half-breed. I'm not putting that down. He was an Edomite. Let's just look at who he was and what he was. He was self-serving. He was godless. He rebelled against God. Watch this. It's against this backdrop of no king from the tribe of David, for 600 years, and a fake, pretender, godless king, it'd be almost like a pastor who doesn't preach the word, doesn't love Jesus, and like Frank Zappa would say, is only in it for the money, but still saying the right words. 
this is too intense. I want a simple, fun message today. It's against this backdrop that Jesus steps in. He gave his children the gift, finally it comes, of the promised king through a virgin, Miriam. You know her as Mary. Born of the line of David. So God shows up when all of our hopes and all of our resources have been exhausted. Have you ever had that experience? Are you at a place right now where all of your hopes and all of your resources have been exhausted and you're wondering, where is God? That's what happened with the Jews after 400 years of slavery. God shows up in Egypt after all their hopes and all of their resources had been exhausted for 300 years. But here's the key. Rose, come on back. God has not forgotten the promise that he's made to you. This is just an introduction. Is that okay? God has not forgotten the promise he's made to you. I know you're saying, why isn't it all filled in yet? The title of the son of David is huge. It's huge significance. Let's begin to pass the communion emblems out, guys, if you will. It shows something. You've got to get this. You've got to see this now. You've got to see this. This blind beggar, Bartimaeus, son of David, Ben David, Hesed, have mercy, have covenantal love on me. You know what shows us? Whether Bartimaeus was a believer or became a believer in that moment, he believes. He believes. To call Jesus the son of David. And that's why, how many of you ever notice I call him the son of David often? Let me show you what we're recognizing. That all of the promises of God center in him. Every single promise that God has made to you and every promise that God has made to me, guess what? It centers in the promises that he made to David. An imperfect man. Now, if you're sitting next to an imperfect person, raise your hand. Imperfect person. Okay? Let's just tell, it, just tell the truth. Shame the devil. He's saying to David, all of my promises rest in your lineage. And all of my hopes rest in your lineage. So listen. You got to hear this. For the money... This is important. You're going to get an all-expense-paid vacation to San Jacinto if you get this. To the Starbucks. The first person to confess Jesus as the son of David in the Bible, who was it? I expect Ron to know this one. The first person in the Bible to confess Jesus. You've got to see this. It had to be a theologian as the son of David. Who do you think it was? Ron. Ron. Huh? I can't hear you. It was not Peter. No, not. But a great guess. Only 3,800 names to go. It was, no, no, he said certainly this man must have been the son of God. Huh? No, the Bar Bartimaeus was not the first. He was the second. You know how men tend to always be second? Women are a lot smarter, right? Who could it have been? It was a woman. It wasn't Mary. It wasn't Martha. Nowhere. But I'm saying, who was the first? Here it is. I got to tell you. Because the donuts are coming out soon. Yeah? I heard somebody. Adam? Anna. No. Oh, you know what? I'm, no. 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 It's good. Guys, I know the answer because I looked it up. I have Google and Logos. Okay, here it is. It was not. It was a woman. This was before, this is when men used to be men and women were, <laughs> yeah, okay, here it is. It was a foreigner, a Canaanite woman. It was a Canaanite woman who wanted to get healed. She recognized Jesus as Ben David. It wasn't Oh, I'm so bummed. The real intelligent Jews. It wasn't the rabbis. It wasn't the Pharisees. It wasn't the Sadducees. It wasn't the Essenes. It's a Gentile, dreaded, 
hated, called behind her back like the Syrophoenician women, dogs, dirt, shiksa, goyim, a Gentile woman who wasn't even educated in God. Makes a preacher's blood boil. That's only half my blood. You should see what my Jewish blood's doing. A foreigner. The second person to confess Jesus who got it. Ben David was a blind beggar. How did the apostles treat this man who, think about this, who recognized what Jesus was and who Jesus was? I'm going to skip the big idea and just read the scripture. Luke 18, 39. Those who led the way rebuked him, told him to be quiet. They didn't get who Jesus was or they would have gotten the resurrection. They wouldn't have been hiding behind closed doors in fear after the crucifixion and waiting for the resurrection and not even believing in the resurrection. They wouldn't have rebuked Mary and the others and say, oh, there's no way Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Because they missed Ben David. All the promises and all the hopes that were given to David would be fulfilled and the kingdom of God would no longer be near it would be in us. Those who led the way often tend to be the organizers. <laughs> organizers are not always open to the, and they're not always the most, well, should I say the world's most compassionate people, and we love you. Organizers have their eyes on the big picture. We need you. We love you. Next week, I want to pick up on this. But I just, I want to get this communion with you right now. But I want to ask you, how many of you see the significance that when God makes a promise 600 years earlier, whether I live to see it or you live to see it, his promises are still yea and amen. It's still yes and so be it. How many of you know that a lot of times those of us in the church and those of us that love God and we study the word, including myself, Sometimes it's a Canaanite woman, the despised one. Sometimes it's the forgotten blind beggar on the side of the road who all of a sudden goes, wait a minute. I heard a story that 600 years ago there were promises, messianic promises made. For those of you who want to understand the end times, you want to understand prophecy, and you want to understand what's called eschatology or the apocalyptics, like the book of Daniel and Revelation's great stuff. I'm all for it. But if you don't get the son of David, nothing else will make sense. This is a key. And so today, in the same way that the Lord had communion with Abraham, how many of you know God had lunch with Abraham? That's called a Christophany. That's Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. How do we know it wasn't the Father? No man can look upon the face of the Father and live, Exodus 33. It was Jesus. Some of you, you can call it theophany. It's a, it's a before Jesus incarnate. He came in flesh. He showed up numerous times. Who really met with David and gave him this hope, this promise, this guarantee? This blind beggar, he gets it. He's healed. His life is completely changed. I want you to know there are so many promises and there is such a hope and there is such a future and there is so much more to just accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's Christianity 090. It's not even 101 yet. That's just getting prepared. We want to live the fullness of our liberty and our inheritance on this side of eternity. Next week, I want to show you how easy it is to miss it and what we have to do to get the fullness of what Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus, our Messiah, did for each and every one of us. So in communion, we come to this realization. And this is just, everyone say hors d'oeuvre. Okay, well, here's the key. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? So I want to ask you this question. If Jesus were looking into, I'll ask it again next week, your unseeing eyes right now, and says, what would you have me do for you? And you can only say one thing. Don't say it out loud. What would it be? Not even Robin Williams and Aladdin. You don't get three wishes. One thing. What would you have me, the God of eternity, 
all of the hopes and promises of God are in me. That's why his promises are yea and amen. What would you wish for? What is it? It's an intimate question. Next week, I want to show you how this intimacy works out. Because organizers, often we miss God because we're so busy organizing. It's important. Chris and I got together and we put together our calendar all the way through 2020. You have to organize budgets. We're organizing our building usage. There's a lot of things we have to organize. But we never want to be so fixated on organizing that we miss intimacy. Because Jesus got out of the crowd and he got in that blind beggar's face. Couldn't even see him. He could feel him. He could sense the ruach, the breath of God. What would you have me do for you? That's communion. When people try to distance you from God, you're too loud! Don't bother the master! Just shut your mouth! Stop saying, praise the Lord. Stop jumping up and down. Don't be like those kids at the altar. What have you just got right there in your face? What would you have me do for you? I want you to come next week ready to answer that question. And it's a renewable resource. Since his mercies are new every morning, Jesus wants to get close in your face. I remember when Marge and I first got married, the thing I noticed, there was somebody in my bed when I woke up in the morning. I noticed when she was on my shoulder, I could sense her breath on my neck. Intimacy. And I understood why God said, tov ma'ot. Very good. God wants to get so close to you, right in your face, relationally, with everything he promised to David. There's so many things he wants to do, but we don't ask. Or we want to be like the Jews at Mount Sinai. Moses, God is freaking me out, man. This this thunder and lightning and all the sound effects and Cecil B. DeMille's, this is freaking me out. You go talk to God, we'll do whatever you tell us God told you to do. Thus we had the Catholic Church. He became our Pope. He says, no. You'll create a golden calf if you do that. I want to get in your face. Not to rebuke you. Not to destroy you. Just to breathe on you the breath of life and say what would you have me to do for you and so during communion as we look to the broken body symbolically as an emblem of our Lord Jesus let's be like Jesus let's look towards heaven let's give thanks Let's remember, he says, this is my body broken for you. This really is the new covenant. He says, we're having a fellowship meal. It's intimacy. You're the bride of Christ. He says, do this right now in remembrance of 600 years earlier, what I promised to David, I'm promising to you. And if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus, you and your household shall be saved. I'm going to do this for your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, and I want to bless you even until a thousand generations. Let's partake. Hmm. He then took the cup in the same way saying, this is my blood. This is your new lineage. You're no longer type O. You're not AB positive. No, no. He said, this is the new covenant. This is the cup of redemption. It surges through your metaphorical spiritual veins. This is what cleanses all of your sins, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He says, I want to get in your face because we're blood. We're familia, we're mishbrucha, we're family. I want to get in your face. And I just want to ask you one question. Now that you love me and your meat is to do my will, What do you want to partner with me in? 
It's called cooperation with the Holy Spirit. What would you have me do for you? He says, when you have this covenant meal, for a Jew, when you break bread together and drink wine, I will never gossip about you. I've got your back. I've got you covered. And even to the demise of my own family, when you come into my home, I will protect you with my very lifeblood. That's how deep covenant is. That's what we're saying. Jesus wants to know, what would you have me do for you? Let's partake. Mm. Father, let's stand to our feet in Jesus' name. Even in the midst of some depth today, we are overwhelmed and mesmerized by the fact that at times when we say we're nothing and the world has forgotten us and we feel so rebuked and at times we feel so discarded, we remember it was a Canaanite women that people despised and wouldn't even allow into the holy city. It was a blind beggar who was in the survival mode. He didn't even have paycheck to paycheck to live by. And here's this blind beggar. He had the faith, the chutzpah to cry out, Ben David, Ben David, have mercy on me. And you did. But help us to be reminded that often it's the uneducated. Often it's the individual that's on the streets. Often it's the, most, the least likely of individuals, not even people of the covenant, that all of a sudden become people of the covenant because they go, wait a minute. God doesn't break his word. And today we're saying, Lord, you made some promises over 3,000 years ago to David. Over 3,500 years ago. Promises. And now they're our promises and they're our children's promises and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. And it goes on. So for that we say, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Love you guys. Next week, I'm going to talk very little about the organizers, but I want to really share with you what does it mean to get face-to-face with God. Think about it. What would you have him do for you? God's favor is on you.